The focus in this lecture is going to be on 3D systems in a central potential. So we will start as always with the time independent Schrodinger equation, which is the equation written in red here. Of course, because we are in three dimensions, the second spatial derivative gets replaced by a Laplacian. And because we are using a central potential, the potential energy is a function not of x, y, and z, or r, theta, and phi, if we are using spherical polar coordinates, but only of r. That is to say, it depends only on r and is independent of theta and phi. The potential is spherically symmetric. That's another way of putting it. Of course, you can easily see that this can be rewritten in this particular form. Laplacian of psi plus twice m by h cross square e minus v of r times psi equals zero. So because of the form of the potential, it would be nice to use spherical polar coordinates here, r, theta and phi. And for that, what we specifically need is the form that the Laplacian takes in spherical polar coordinates. This should be familiar from first year vector analysis, that the Laplacian in spherical polar coordinates takes this rather, well, not so simple looking form. But as we will see, that despite looking rather complicated, this particular form for the Laplacian allows you to separate out the Schrodinger equation into three ordinary differential equations. So if we plug this in the time independent Schrodinger equation, this is what the equation turns out to be. The first three terms here are nothing but the Laplacian of psi and the final term is of course twice m by h cross by e minus b of r times psi bracket ending missing here. So that's what you need to put in. So as I said, this is an equation which we can separate out into three ordinary differential equations. And the way to do that would be to start with the separation ansatz. But rather than trying to separate out r, theta and phi all in one go, we are going to take it in steps. We will write the function psi of r, theta and phi as a product of two functions. One, capital R, which is a function of small r alone, and the other, which I'm going to call y, capital Y, which is a function of theta and phi. After this, we will carry out the standard steps in separation of variables. We are going to plug this form into the PDE itself, and then we are going to use the fact that capital Y is a constant as far as these derivatives are concerned, so it will come out here. And of course, these will only be derivatives of capital R with respect to small r, and they will become ordinary derivatives. In these, on the other hand, it's capital R which will come out of the partial derivatives, and you will have capital Y staying inside. Capital Y being a function of both two variables, theta and phi, these will still stay partial derivatives at the stage. And then, as usual, we are going to divide through by capital R times capital Y. And when we carry out all that, this particular equation takes this form. Now, as you can see, the part in orange here depends only on theta and phi, and the rest depends on small r. And that tells us that we can actually separate this out into two equations, this part will become a constant, a so-called constant of separation, which I'm going to call minus lambda. And if we use that, we end up with this partial differential equation. It's still not an ordinary differential equation yet, because y, as I said, is a function of both theta and phi. And this is the partial differential equation, which capital Y will obey. This is just what you get by equating this to a constant minus lambda. Why have I chosen to write this constant as minus lambda rather than say plus lambda? That should be clear very soon. And if you put this piece here equal to minus lambda and then rearrange 
terms, it's pretty easy to see that the equation which capital R obeys, which is an ordinary differential equation, simply takes this form. So we now have two equations, an angular equation for capital Y and a radial equation for capital R. Now the radial equation is going to occupy our time in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to focus on the angular equation. Notice that the angular equation is completely independent of the potential energy, as long as, of course, the potential energy depends on R alone. So, as long as we are talking of a central potential. So, in a sense, the angular equation is really more important than the radial one because it is applicable to a vastly larger number of examples. In fact, you have already met this equation before, not in quantum mechanics at all. You have met this equation in electrostatics, basically because the angular part of the Laplacian is something which you also see when you try to solve the Laplace equation in spherical polar coordinates. So, this particular equation actually should be a familiar one, but we are going to try to solve this in some detail now. But before we try to solve the angular equation, let us take a step back and try to understand why the separation occurs the way it does. And also, let us try to understand the physical significance of the angular equation, so to speak. For this, let me point out that if you have a spherically symmetrical potential, that is a central potential, then the Hamiltonian that you will have will be spherically symmetric, which means carry out any rotation whatsoever, the Hamiltonian will not change. So, rotation symmetry plays a big role in the theory of such Hamiltonians. So, just to re remind you of whatever rotation symmetry aspects that you learned in your last semester, rotational symmetry essentially means that if you take the unitary operator which rotates through an angle theta about the axis n hat, then the Hamiltonian will change under such a rotation of coordinates to rn hat theta h rn hat theta inverse the standard similarity transformation, but because we have a rotationally symmetric Hamiltonian, this result must be the same as H itself. Let us next make use of the fact that R n hat theta is an exponential of, of minus I n hat L theta by H cross, where L is nothing but a vector operator with three components, Lx, Ly, Lz, the standard angular momentum components, and this result has to be true for all theta. It, of course, has to be true when theta is infinitesimally small. So, if you just expand this out in powers of theta, you get 1, which of course here means the identity operator, minus i n hat dot l theta by h cross plus higher order terms h times 1 plus i n hat dot l theta by h cross. This whole thing must be exactly equal to h. Of course, if this thing is exactly equal to h, this is equal to h at every order of theta. And if you just take a look at the order theta term, you get minus n dot l times h, apart from the i theta by h cross factor, as one term, which is order theta. The other term, which is of order theta, is what you get when you take identity from here, h from here, and this term from here. That will give you n dot l theta by h cross times i with h on the left. So, if you combine the two together, what you end up with is the statement that n dot l commutes with capital H simply because the, the h on the right hand side is something you already have when you take identity h i. So, the extra terms must all vanish, in particular this commutator of n dot l with h must vanish. Since this is true for n pointing in any direction, it's true when n points in the direction of the x-axis, the y-axis and the z-axis respectively. And this implies that for any spherically symmetrical Hamiltonian, you must have these commutation relations. That the Hamiltonian must commute with all three components of the angular momentum. Notice that this is not really a statement which follows from the algebra of the, of the operators. This really follows from the geometry of the system. 
The fact that the system is spherically symmetrical, that's what translates to these commutation relations. Now, of course, if Lx, Ly and Lz all commute with H, I should be able to find simultaneous eigens of H with any one of them. Why any one of them and why not all three? Simply because, as you already know, Lx, Ly and Lz do not commute. And as you have already seen in the last semester, the commutation relations really follows from the fact that rotations don't commute. So it's really a geometrical statement once again. It's something you see in quantum mechanics, but the origin of this is really not quantum. The origin of this is more the geometrical fact that rotations about different axes do not commute. However, despite the fact that Lx and Ly do not commute with Lz, Lx square plus Ly square plus Lz square commutes with all three, so with Lz in particular. And since H commutes with all three components of L, H also commutes with L square. So now we have a set of operators H, L square and Lz which commute with each other. So it should be possible for us to find out states which are eigenstates of all three of these operators simultaneously. So what we can do is we can have a state psi which is characterized by three eigenvalues, that of h, that of l square and that of lz. And from our theory of angular momentum that we know already, l square eigenvalues are of the form l into l plus 1 h cross square, lz eigenvalues are of the form ml h cross. As you all know, the reason why we have to use this suffix L on M is to distinguish this quantity ML from another similar quantity, MS, which is a spin projection eigenvalue. In this lecture, we are going to ignore spin completely, so MS is not going to be something we are going to discuss here. There is, of course, another reason why we cannot really use the simpler label M instead of ML, and that's simply because the mass of the particle has already been denoted by M. Now, in this lecture, at least for the rest of this lecture, we are just going to talk about the angular part of the Schrodinger equation. And in this angular part, the mass will not come in. So what I will do is, just for the sake of simplifying my writing a bit, I am going to simply replace ML by M for the rest of this lecture. So from this point on, M stands for the eigenvalue or stands in place of the eigenvalue of LZ. Of course, it's not the eigenvalue of LZ, it's uh, eigenvalue of LZ in units of H bar and not the mass of the particle. In the next lecture, we are going to come back and reintroduce the mass parameter m because we are going to talk about the radial equation then. However, there ml, this quantity, will not show up again. At least, if it shows up, we are going to call it ml there. Now, what I said right now is ml will not show up in that. The reason being, the energy, which is what we are going to calculate, at least one of the things we are going to calculate in the next lecture, happens to be independent of ML. As you can see, in general, the energy for a particle in a central potential depends only on L and some other label, N, which talks about the energy band or energy level. Why does it not depend on ML? The answer lies in something which can formally be called the wigner eckhart theorem, which is a very important theorem uh, involving the use of rotational symmetry in quantum mechanics. Now, some of you have already studied this theorem in the last semester, but the proof that E does not depend on M, notice that I have started calling it M already. The, the proof that E does not depend on M is actually simple enough so that we can just use elementary 
angular momentum algebra to figure that out without having to involve the full might of the wigner eckhart theorem. So, just to see how this goes, notice that H commutes with L minus the lowering operator simply because L minus is made out of Lx and Ly and H commutes with both of them. Since H commutes with L minus, we can carry out this calculation. Let L minus act on the state psi NLM and whatever result I get, this resulting function, I apply H on that. Since H and L minus commute, I can of course move H to the other side. And now that H is sitting right next to psi NLM, that is, it gets to act on psi NLM, it's going to bring out the energy. So, and so E being a number just comes out of the action. And so you are left with E times L minus H psi NLM. So this function L minus psi NLM, which from the theory of angular momentum we know is proportional to psi NLM minus 1, that is, it's the state with m value 1 lower, is also an energy eigenstate of H with the same energy eigenvalue as psi NLM is. This is how you manage to see that the energy is actually independent of the value of m. So, in the next lecture, where we will be concerned primarily by, with the calculation of the energy eigenvalues for different potentials, m will not, or rather ml will not directly show up. Of course, when we consider the whole wave function, it will be made out of both the radial part and the angular part, and ml will definitely show its face there. At this stage, you may be wondering that while this is all well and good, just what does this fact that L square can be simultaneously diagonalized along with H. That is, you can find out eigenfunctions, which are eigenfunctions of both H and L square and LZ as well. What does this have to do with our angular equation? We will turn to that question next. To understand that, what you need to do is write down the angular momentum operators in spherical polar coordinates. Of course, what you have on the left here are the angular momentum operators written in terms of the coordinate representation, in particular Cartesian coordinates. And if you just use the relationship between the Cartesian coordinates and the spherical polar coordinates and just use the standard chain rule of partial differentiation, after a bit of hard work, not very hard work, but a bit of non-trivial labor, you would find Lx, Ly, Lz turn out to be these three forms. Now, just in case you're wondering why the final form here, Lz, in spherical polar coordinates is so simple, at least in appearance, compared to Lx and Ly, which look rather more complicated, let me point out to you that what Lz does actually is that it generates rotations about the z-axis. Now, if you rotate about the z-axis, what happens in spherical polar coordinates is theta does not change, only phi changes. And since Lz essentially talks about how much a wave function changes when you rotate about the z-axis, of course, all that it really has is a partial derivative with respect to the one variable which changes, which is del del phi. On the other hand, Lx and Ly generate rotations about the x and the y axis. And if you rotate about the x axis, both theta and phi change and they change in a rather complicated fashion depending on exactly where you are. Which is why the Lx, Ly operators don't really look very simple in spherical polar coordinates. Now, using these operators and some standard calculus and algebra, you can easily show that the L square operator takes this particular form. I'm not going to work this out for you, but it's really pretty easy for you to work out. Okay, we'll take some labor, but it's not really very difficult conceptually. 
But you should realize that what you have in the brackets here, apart from this minus h cross square, is nothing but the operator which was acting on y in the angular equation that we wrote down a while ago. Okay, so, the angular equation essentially is nothing but the eigen equation for L square. So, this tells us that y, the angular part, is an eigenstate of L square corresponding to an eigenvalue which is minus lambda times minus h cross square. You had minus lambda in the original angular equation. Here you have an extra minus h cross square in the L square. So, what you end up with is lambda times h cross square is the L squared eigenvalue. Now, this should tell you why I took the separation constant there to be minus lambda. That is what ensured that here plus lambda in units of h cross square happens to be the L squared eigenvalue. Since I already had this L squared thing in mind, I deliberately chose that separation constant with a minus sign there. Let us now continue with our main aim, which is separation of the equations of uh, that we have obtained and finally solving them. As I have said, we are only going to deal with the angular equation in the rest of this lecture. So, let us take a, another look at the angular equation. So, what we want to do is separate this angular equation out. And since y is a function of theta and phi, what we are doing here is writing that as again a product of two functions, capital theta of theta and capital phi of phi. And we follow exactly the same procedure as we always do. Plug in this particular form for y in the equation itself and then try to separate out theta and dependent pieces and phi dependent pieces. If you plug this in and divide by capital theta capital phi, what you are going to land up with is this equation. And here, the part in magenta here is the only part which depends on small phi. The rest only depends on small theta. So, it is easy to see that the answers will only work if this part is a constant. Now, what we will do is we will insist that this particular constant is a negative number, negative real number, that is given by minus m square. Now, why negative real number? Of course, I am pretty sure most of you know that, but I will still insist on explaining this. But let us take a look at this. This equation, of course, can be rewritten in this form which is the form for the familiar simple harmonic oscillator equation in classical mechanics and you all know how to solve it. The solution to this is simply given by capital phi of phi is e to the i small m phi. At this stage, I might want to draw your attention to one fact. In the simple harmonic oscillator theory that we did in classical mechanics, we had an equation very much like this and there, we would have liked to write the solution to this equation in this form. Of course, there, instead of phi, you had t, but the basic idea for the mathematics stays the same. We would have perhaps written the solution in terms of sines and cosines rather than in terms of exponentials. Now, the real reason why we prefer to the I am phi here is the fact that, as we have already seen, Lz is an operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian and so we should be able to write down our energy eigenfunctions in such a way that they also happen to be Lz eigenstates. Lz in spherical polar coordinates, remember, is simply h cross over i del del phi and as you can easily see, if you feed into the im phi to Lz, that is if you feed this form of capital phi to Lz, what you are going to get is simply h cross times m e to the im phi, which shows that this capital phi is actually an eigenstate or eigenfunction of the operator Lz. So, that is one of the major reasons why instead of using sin m phi or cos m phi, which are not Lz eigenstates, we prefer to use e to the im phi. 
Now, small phi as a coordinate has a, as a peculiarity which is pretty straightforward to understand. If you go all the way round, uh, so that small phi ch changes by 2 pi, you are actually going to get the same physical point as phi. So, increasing phi by 2 pi should not change anything ultimately, which means your capital phi, the function that you are dealing with, should really be the same no matter whether you are working it out for, uh, for small phi or for small phi plus 2 pi. So you should have this result. And if you put this in, what you get is it is the im times 2 pi must be 1 and that immediately gives us a quantization condition. It tells us the small m has to be an integer which means lz eigenvalues are quantized in units of h cross. So, as you can see, the quantization of the lz eigenvalue simply follows from the demand that the wave function should be a single valued function of position. By the way, why did we go in for negative value for the separation constant here? Well, that's simply because that's the only way you can get a function which will be single valued as you go around. If you had chosen a positive value or a complex value for the separation constant, you can easily show that the only solution that will be the same at small phi and small phi plus 2 pi is identically zero. So that is why we chose a negative separation constant there. Now once the separation constant is chosen, the equation for capital theta simply becomes this. Let me just remind you of how this came about. This is, was the original equation after I put in the separation on SARS. And this is what we replace by minus m square. And once you do that, bring the lambda to the other side, multiply through by capital theta. This, of course, is the equation that you are going to get. Let us now concentrate on trying to solve this theta equation. Now, the theta equation has a trigonometric function sine theta stuck in many places. So the first thing we will do is to change things by a substitution of variables so that the equation involves purely algebraic factors. And the substitution that we carry out is cos theta is replaced by a variable z. Now this is a genuine decent substitution to make because cos theta is a one-to-one -one function of theta in the interval 0 to pi over which theta runs. This is also the reason why some other trigonometric functions like sine theta, etc. could not be used in this substitution. And what we will do here is we will actually be mathematically correct at this stage. When I'm changing my variable from theta to z, we are going to change the name of the dependent variable, capital theta, to something else. And I'm just going to call it capital F for the time being. Now, as I've explained before, physicists usually don't bother to change the name of the dependent variable when they change the name of the independent variable, as should really be done. However, this is one situation where almost every textbook allows you to make this change of the nomenclature. My suspicion is that's because writing capital theta is a pain. So, we will try to change it to something else as soon as the legitimate chance arises. Anyway, once you have substituted cos theta by z, you have to change the derivatives. So dd theta by chain rule turns out to be simply minus sine theta ddz. So ddz is minus 1 by sine theta dd theta. So you can already see 1 by sine theta stuck here. So that can be easily replaced by minus ddz. What I need is a 1 by sine theta dd theta here. But that of course is not there. There is an extra sine square sine theta in the numerator rather than in the denominator. But we can easily take care of that by writing it this way. So I have replaced or rather I have displayed a 1 by sine theta dd theta term minus 1 by sine theta dd theta term here and here. Here I had to do no work. It was already there and the two minuses give you a plus. 
But in order to compensate for the fact that you have a sine theta in the numerator here, you have a sine square theta factor. And now, it's straightforward. You change the minus 1 by sine theta dt theta everywhere to dz. And sine square theta, of course, is 1 minus cos square theta, so can be replaced by 1 minus z square. By doing this, you end up with this equation. d dz of 1 minus z square df dz plus lambda minus m square by 1 minus z square times f is 0. Now, this is a pretty well-known differential equation, which mathematicians have studied for a long, long time. It's called the associated Legendre equation. Associated Lahodre equation, if you really want to pronounce the French name correctly, but we are not going to bother with that. We are going to call it Legenda. As I said a while ago, the angular part of the equation that we are dealing with arises not only in the study of, a, of the Schrodinger equation under a central potential, it also occurs in many other places, including in electrostatics, when you try to solve the Laplace equation in spherical polar coordinates. So, I am sure you must have met this equation earlier, although in most elementary courses what is done is that you assume that there is no phi dependence in the solution, so you assume only axisymmetric solutions, that's simply to make the calculation simpler, and also because there are many nice physical examples where axial symmetry is present, so we can still handle quite a lot of interesting cases this way. If there is no phi dependence, then it is the I m phi has to be phi independent and that can only happen if m is 0. So, many of you have already seen this equation, but maybe not in this form. You have seen this equation when m is set to 0 and this is the form the equation takes there. This is called the Lahod or Legendre differential equation and I am pretty sure most of you have solve this in some detail. Now, there are some subtle points about solving this differential equation as well, issues with singularities and all that, but I am not going to talk a lot about solving the Legendre differential equation here, simply because we are going to solve the associated Legendre equation in some detail in this lecture, and whatever I say about the subtleties will also apply to this equation. So, let me just remind you of some results which many of you may have already be very familiar with. Firstly, as you can see, the legendary equation has regular singular points at z equal to plus minus 1. z equal to 0 is a nice regular point. There is no problem there. But because of the 1 minus z square factor which goes with d2f dz2, there is a regular singularity at z equal to plus minus 1. What that means is that we expect the solution to give us trouble at z equal to plus minus 1. And this happens. This really happens. The solution diverges as z goes to plus minus 1. And let me remind you that z being cos theta, z going to plus minus 1 simply means cos theta goes to 0 or pi. And that means we are on the axis. Now since the axis is very much a part of the physical system, you simply cannot ignore that. So, you cannot allow your potential in electrostatics or wave function here to diverge as z goes to plus minus 1. So, what you must do is choose lambda to take only certain special values. Then, lambda has to be of the form L into L plus 1 where L takes the values 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on non-negative integers. And this tells you that the L square eigenvalue, which, which remember is lambda h cross square, is quantized in the form L into L plus 1 h cross square. So, can only be 0, then 2 h cross square, then 6 h cross square and so on. Now, if lambda is taken to be L into L plus 1, then one solution of the legendary equation is a polynomial of degree L. Let me point out that the other solution to the legendary equation is still an infinite series and still will diverge at z equal to plus minus 1. So, to get a physically meaningful solution, what you do is take that one solution which is a polynomial and set the coefficient of the other solution to 0. 
this is exactly what we also did in the case of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, and these polynomials, or these polynomials with specific choice for the overall constant, are called Legendre polynomials. And the lth degree Legendre polynomial has the symbol PL and obeys this equation. That is, PL is given by this formula, which is called Roderick's formula. Of course, you could solve the legendary equation by the power series method to find out the recursion relations for the coefficients and find out the polynomials that way. There is just another way of finding out the legend lth legendary polynomial. This is very similar to the Roderick's formula that we had for the Hermite polynomials. And as we have been saying, there is a general reason why you have Roderick's formulas for different kinds of such polynomials. And we will discuss that in a later lecture. More, that will be a more mathematical lecture, but we will try to tie together all these different polynomials, the Hermite, the Legender, the Laguerre, that we see in quantum mechanics and in other applications. And we will try to understand why they all have a formula which looks somewhat like take some function, differentiate this L times. And all these formulas are called Roderick's formula in general. Now, just like in the case of Hermite polynomials, we also can find out something called a generating function, which is a function of two variables T and Z, which for the Legendre polynomials turn out to be 1 by square root of 1 minus 2Tz plus T square. And if you treat this like a function of t and expand it out in powers of t, the coefficients, of course, will depend on z. And it turns out that the coefficients here are exactly the lth order Legendre polynomials. Now, how do you prove this? One way could be to start from the Roderick's formula and use the Cauchy integral formula that we used for Hamite polynomials. That will give us an exact expression for this generating function. Now, starting from the generating function or from Roderick's formula, you can prove several interesting results. One of them is this orthogonality result for the Legendre polynomials, which simply says that if you multiply two Legendre polynomials PL and PK with each other and integrate from minus 1 to plus 1, you end up with 0 if L and K are different. If L and K are equal, that is, this is just PL square DZ integral, then that of course cannot be 0. That turns out to be 2 by 2L plus 1. Let me just point out that this is very similar to the equation that we had for the Hermite polynomials. There we had HM, Z, HM, Z, DZ, but firstly the interval was not minus 1 to plus 1, it was from minus infinity to plus infinity. And you had an e to the minus z square that also gave you a delta mn times a factor which was 2 to the n n factorial root pi. Although the details are different, like the presence of an extra e to the minus z square factor here, this similarity between the two should be noted, and we will see later that this is not really an accident. There's a deeper theory at work which tells you that some such kind of orthonormality relation will be there in both cases. For the time being, let's just focus on the Legendre polynomials. One other result that you can derive, both from the Roderick's formula or perhaps more easily from the genetic function, are the recursion relations. And these are two recursion relations which you can derive pretty easily. One by differentiating both sides of the genetic function with respect to t, the other one by differentiating both sides of the generating function with respect to z and matching coefficients on both sides of the resulting equations. This one relates L plus 1th order Legendre polynomial to the Lth and L minus 1th order. And this one essentially tells you that the derivative of the Lth order Legendre polynomial can be expressed in terms of the Lth order and L minus 1th order polynomials. 
So these are going to be pretty useful for various calculations that we will carry out. With this detour about the legendary equation, let us return to the task of solving the associated legendary equation by standard methods of handling differential equations. In this differential equation, which can of course also be written in this form, two minus two z df dz plus lambda minus m square by one minus z square times f equals zero. It is easy to see that z equal to zero is a regular point, so we can solve this equation by power series. So apparently there should be no problem at all in solving this equation. However, if we try to solve this directly by power series, we will meet with trouble later. And the reason for the trouble is, as I've said, z equal to plus minus one are regular singular points of this differential equation. So the solution can diverge there. In fact, both the solutions cannot be regular as z goes to plus minus one. So one of the independent solutions at least has to diverge there. Now, if you try to solve this equation by the power series method, which is, let me just quickly show you what will go wrong. In the power series method, of course, what you try to do is set f uh, as a power series c n z to the n, sum over all n from 0 to infinity, and plug that into the differential equation after multiplying through by all the denominators. So you have 1 minus z square whole square sitting here, 2z into 1 minus z square sitting here, and so on. Now let us quickly figure out the various powers of n that you will get from the term c n z to the n from this term. So I'm not solving the full problem by power series. I'm just showing you how the thing will go. If you start with c n z to the n, the second derivative will give you z to the n minus 2. So this term will give you z to the n minus 2. This term with the extra z square will give you z to the n. This term will give you z to the n plus 2. Here this term will give you z to the n, right? Because this gives you z to the n minus 1. And this extra z will give you z to the n. This again will give you z to the n plus 2. And here this will give you z to the n, of course. And this will give you z to the n plus 2. So from the same c n z to the n term, you'll get three kinds of terms. You'll get z to the n minus 2, z to the n, and z to the n plus 2. All of them with c n as coefficients. So if you try to bring all of these powers of z to the same value, say z to the n, what will happen is instead of c n being the coefficient here, here you are going to get c n plus 2. Here, of course, you're going to get c n, and here you're going to get c n minus 2, multiplying z to the n coming from this term. As a result, when you try writing the recursion relation for the power series here, you'll get a three-term recursion relation. You'll get a recursion relation involving Cn minus 2, Cn, and Cn plus 2. Now, what's wrong with that? The problem is, we know that there is a potential divergence at z going to plus minus 1. And that has to be handled somehow. If you have a three-term recursion relation, it's very difficult to handle such problems. If, on the other hand, you had a two-term recursion relation, then as we have seen for the harmonic oscillator case, truncation is very easy to do. If you stop the power series at one point by insisting that a particular coefficient vanishes, then since all the subsequent coefficients depend on this one, they will all vanish. With three-term recursion relations, on the other hand, if you make one coefficient vanish, that will not allow you to say that the rest of the series will vanish. Because the rest of the series will depend not only on that coefficient, but also on the previous one, which is not zero. So this is why we want to avoid three-term recursion relations. How do we convert this equation into one that can be handled more easily? The answer to that lies in the standard rule that I had laid out also for the harmonic oscillator case. When you want to solve a differential equation, the most important thing is to know your enemy. That is, know the singularities and the behavior close to the singularities very, very well. 
since this lecture has already run too long and there is a lot of ground to cover still before we can get to a satisfactory solution to the angular equations, let me call it a day to day. In the next lecture, we are going to see exactly how to convert this, the associated Rajodhar equation, into something which can be handled much more neatly by the power series method. We will also see how the solutions to the associated legendary equation, at least the solutions that we would like, the well-behaved solutions, connect to the simpler legendary polynomials and we will explore many more properties of these functions. So until then, bye for now.